Hi there, this is Dr. Coates again. Uh, my voice is a little bit low and I hope I'm not coming down with a cold, but uh, here I am dutifully giving you your lecture for, for Thursday, the 21st of March. This is the second of two um, lectures about ekphrasis, uh, which again, if, uh, if you haven't seen the, the lecture from Tuesday, I really urge you to see that before you continue on with this one. Um, but this particular lecture is the one that forms the basis of the second part of our Twitter conversation for the first week of this module. Um, so I also recommend that you, you at least read through this transcript. Um, so I'm, I'm basically going to be doing a, brief, a debrief of <coughs> the consequences of um, having a poem about an artwork and a bit of a response to what you've all been saying on your Twitter conversations. I, I'm sorry, well, with, with your tweets within the Twitter conversation. And I would just like to um, you know, say my piece and then have you respond to what I was saying not necessarily just to agree with me, but to find other parts in the text that will allow you to latch on to the tone either of the painting or of the poem, or both, uh, because they are in conversation with each other. So, um, okay, so here, here I'm going to go back to the transcript. On Tuesday, I spoke about ekphrastic poetry's attempt to draw in elements of the visual arts and combine them with poetic language. Today's lecture contains more about the consequences of placing two artistic representations side by side in the ways that ekphrasis does. I think you'll find that both artworks have a heightened and maybe bracketed relationship to one another, that it's possible to read both of them ironically or to keep oscillating between them, thinking, well, this is what the artwork means, but then the poem is illustrating the meaning of the artwork in a way that it hadn't ever occurred to you before, right? And um, there's, there are other ways, too, as I said on Tuesday, that if you don't know about the painting or the artwork, the visual artwork, um, then parts of the poem will make sense. So they are they're mutually illustrative, um, right? And, and that, that's part of the point of this week. It's impossible not to perform comparisons between the two texts, uh, and then of course sometimes more, uh, especially the visual artworks that are put within uh, the poem that are being juxtaposed. The poem speaker gets the last word, so you might think that the poem always has the advantage over the visual artwork, but just as many ekphrastic poems hold up the visual artwork and I'm sorry, just as many ekphrastic poems as not hold up the visual artwork in such high esteem that the poem looks like the unloved stepchild in comparison. So, so do be careful about assuming that the poem is always going to be you know, in some way better uh, than, than the visual art. Uh, my best advice about ekphrastic situations is to try your hardest to unlock the relationship between the poems that the poem speaker wishes to establish between the lyric moment and especially the poem's tone and the artwork that, for the most part, triggered it. So most ekphrastic poems are, you know, the speaker of a poem. Oda, Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn is definitely this way. Um, looking at something and then recording the sort of spontaneous impre impressions that occur to the speaker, um, having looked at the artwork. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you think about it as being mutually illustrative and being juxtaposed at all times, so you're thinking about, uh, for the case of the Musée du Beaux-Arts, uh, the Bruegel painting and the Auden poem at all times together. So for example, in this week's Twitter conversations, many of you have been trying valiantly to come up with authoritative assessments of how the poem depicts the epic content uh, of the, the myth of Icarus in relation to the mundane setting of the Bruegel painting. According to the myth of the fall of Icarus, uh, which I'm going to explain it now just in case you're not aware of that one, but um, you probably are. It's one of the more famous stories of Greek mythology. Uh, Icarus, along with his father Daedalus, tried to escape from a tower by gluing birds' feathers to their arms with beeswax. Um, despite his father's warning, young Icarus flew too high in the air and therefore too close to the sun, and his wax melted, whereupon he fell to his death. Now, of course, this would not have happened. <laughs> you, can't, you actually can't fly by by gluing feathers to your arms, but it's also true that the higher we would go, the colder it would be. Uh, the Greeks had no way of knowing that, but um, for the purposes of this myth, just assume that the closer you would get to the sun, the hotter it would be, even though you know you and I know that when we get to the outer space, it's actually pretty cold, and you can't breathe. So Anyway, um, oh, then when you get really close to the sun, of course, it gets hot again, uh, but you'd be dead long before then, and also you wouldn't be flying because there's no air. I digress. Okay, um, I could, let's see here. In this painting by Bruegel, no matter how famous we, would, we might find the story and how much we might have imagined ourselves reacting to the same scene had we been there, uh, which sometimes happens, you sort of vicariously inhabit a, a narrative and, and compare how you might have reacted to the reactions of the, the characters that are in that narrative. The other people in this painting simply go about their lives instead of trying to help or even batting an eyelash in surprise. 
I could point out that most of the people in the painting are reasonably far away from Icarus, and so might not even have been able to, to hear his cry. But this seems beside the point, because the painter, Bruegel, is contributing to the effect of understating the importance of Icarus's fall in the grand scheme of things. The myth of Icarus is a story about hubris, an unchecked aspiration and arrogance, which is then punished extremely severely. And in fact, many scholars and students of mythology think the punishment does not at all fit the crime of his arrogance, because uh, you don't have to die to be taken down a peg or two. But here we have a painting of the fall of Icarus in which Icarus appears in the title, so we know we should already have some sort of baseline familiarity with the story uh, within the myth, and we should be looking for him somewhere in the scene. But the fall is not only not located in the center of the painting, as you might expect, but it makes absolutely no stir in the audience that the painting represents for us, and which we, the contemporary viewers, uh, can use as a convenient foil to contrast our own responses uh, to those of the people within the scene. If Icarus's fall were right in the middle of the canvas, then I think a lot of the sort of bystander effect tweets that we saw yesterday would make a lot more sense to me. Because Bruegel would be implicitly saying that Icarus was indeed the most important person in this situation, and everybody else in the painting was completely wrong not to have seen the hand of the gods in the form of divine retribution at work in their midst. But he isn't. He's off in the corner like an afterthought. And if anything, the farmer at his plow looks more like the main character of the scene um, because of perspective, since he's so much bigger than the others, and he's the first thing that you notice when you look at the frame. Um, Auden notices this too, and expects his readers to know about both the Icarus myth and the Bruegel painting, or to be in a class like this one where somebody like me is going to prompt you to see it in this way. I'm confident about that my last sentence... Um, that Auden, Auden speaker expects the readers to know about the, both the Icarus myth and the Bruegel painting. Um, because I can tell you that the Musée de Beaux-Arts was written right before the outbreak of World War II, and so I actually feel like Auden had bigger fish to fry uh, by talking about this painting. He's making a political point. And it occurs alongside many other extremely compassionate poems that Auden was writing during those years to draw attention to the plight of people who were dying in the sort of satellite conflicts that uh, were leading that, that occurred in the world leading up to World War II, like, for example, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria or the Spanish Civil War, which many of you know about, uh, if only from the art of Picasso, who was also, you know, writing or making paintings about uh, the suffering of people. Um, and so Auden's probably making connections between the suffering of people in far-off lands at the hands of practitioners of fascism, militarism, Nazism, etc., that would shortly, if Western democracies did not stand up to them, the bad guys, uh, out of love for those who do not necessarily belong to our own countries, uh, if, if we didn't stand up to them, then the Nazis would visit the same sort of destruction and suffering on America and England that they were doing in China or Spain. That sort of political awareness of the wartime context makes this poem, for me at least, much more interesting in that it's not just talking about abstract suffering, which of course would be valuable in itself, but about the many linkages between suffering wherever, whenever, and to whomever it occurs around the world, to our own physical and mental comfort and aspirations. So even if I'm living in America in 1939, um, reading this poem, um, and I'm saying, well, people in China are not like me, and, and therefore, you know, why would I get involved trying to help them? All right, Auden would say, their suffering will be like your suffering not too long from now if you don't stand up to the Nazis, which, of course, is what we did. So an opening line like, quote, about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters, is one that really ought to spook you. Uh, first of all, just like whenever you take a multiple choice test, always beware the statement that is phrased as an absolute. Because even if you can only find one instance in which the statement isn't true, its whole truth claim is still going to be invalidated. And maybe this painting by Bruegel is the one instance in which the old masters, Bruegel among them, was wrong about suffering. Also, clearly the poem continues on beyond this first line, so the speaker's point must be more complex than simply agreeing that, yeah, Bruegel was right to de-emphasize the fall of Icarus, because ethically speaking, nobody's suffering is inherently more important than anybody else's, and we all suffer to some degree or other, even if our suffering may not take on an exotic form involving beeswax, like Icarus's did. So consider, to any one of us, deeply enmeshed as we are in our own individual realities, the story of Icarus might mean more than it would if its events actually transpired before us. It might mean more as a symbol, right, or as an object lesson or a parable. In other words, if we valued the myth of Icarus precisely because it was a parable about how the truly arrogant deserve extreme comeuppance, 
or as an extra or as an excuse or justification about why we shouldn't fly too high using untested means of conveyance because we're just going to get burned and then fall to our deaths then it actually has very little to do with Icarus beyond the fact that his character makes that object lesson about human behavior and physical limitations more concrete and interesting because it is embodied in mythic narrative there's no reason to have any expectation that the sun might have stopped shining at the moment before Icarus's beeswax melted thereby saving him or that the wind should have stopped blowing so that the ships could turn around and pick him up before he drowned. Although it is true that that sort of thing happens sometimes in Greek myth, although not at all in real life, and so maybe if you're thinking about it in terms of its being, you know, mythology, maybe the sun herself came down and picked them up, you know, maybe that was a possibility. Um, they don't happen in real life. But those possibilities do nevertheless get a nod in Auden's poem. Here I'm quoting from the last few lines. Quote, the sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive delicate ship that must have seen something amazing a boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on Unquote. nobody asked the sun whether it wanted to keep shining and nobody checked to see whether the wind cared or the ships felt remorse about his death because that would be absurd it's more appropriate to ask why the human beings in the scene didn't do more for him since the human beings could certainly have done more, and whether either Bruegel or Auden regret that Icarus died through the negligence of those bystanders. After all, if the Nazis had taken over the planet in World War II, the sun would have kept shining, and there still would have been ships and wind. There also still would have been people, and life would have gone on. But there would have been a lot more suffering. I think Auden's tone is actually pretty precisely rendered, although not particularly clearly, in terms of Bruegel's painting. At the end of the first stanza, the speaker weirdly calls up for our appraisal an unplaced moment in one or more works by unspecified old masters. So before he gets to the Bruegel poem, uh, uh, Bruegel painting in the second stanza, he talks about the old masters in general. Um, and in the unspecified paintings of those old masters, suffering is rendered in some sort of characteristically understated way as, and here I'm quoting again, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. Unquote. On the one hand, I love the fact that Auden is talking about dogs in this poem, uh, with their doggy life, because uh, I, I love dogs. <laughs> and what they might have desired, what, what dogs might have desired from a poem alluding to the high seriousness of Greek mythology. I don't get the sense that we're talking about a great dog, like three-headed Cerberus or something. Cerberus didn't have a doggy life, after all. He, you know, he guarded the underworld for Hades. That's pretty undoggy, and it's it's a huge deal. Uh, but why do we get mention of the torturer's horse as being innocent? I'm not trying to suggest that the torturer's horse is not innocent of the torture its master makes his profession, but it's a weirdly dissonant image to bring up, and the speaker apparently felt the need to reassure us that the horse was innocent. So something is amiss here. It should call to your mind a lot of questions about the relationship between spatial placement, being at the scene of a crime, even if you are definitely not the perpetrator nor the victim of the crime, and complicity in that crime. Maybe the torturer's horse is guilty of not throwing his master, since he must on some level or other know that his rider is a really bad dude. Horses and riders know each other pretty well, I gather. I've never ridden a horse. Um, or maybe like the contrast I just made between the desires of the inanimate landscape or the ship itself, which has no, has no real feelings because it's you know, made out of wood, um, and that being contrasted with the actual people on, at the scene of, of Icarus's fall um, you know, who are not inanimate and could have jumped into the water and saved his, his life. Um, human beings have moral obligations that the inanimate, inanimate landscape do not. The contrast is being made in this stanza um, between what the animals know or do and the much larger responsibilities that we should assign to human beings who are, you know, sentient. <laughs> if it were the torturer's best friend rather than the torturer's horse, we would like that human being a lot less than the horse, right? So ask yourself how far removed you would need to be as a human being before an audience would feel comfortable calling you an innocent if you were standing right next to a torturer while scratching your behind against a tree. The torturer's second cousin. The torturer's casual acquaintance. The guy that happened to be standing near the torturer but didn't know him from Adam. Maybe that's it, right? Now, swap out torturer and replace with Nazi. All right? 
Because you don't necessarily know that a torturer is a torturer unless he's like carrying a rack with him or, you know, maybe he's just, you know, somebody who happens to be a torturer by day, but at night looks like just like any others of us, as we sometimes say about serial killers, right? Um, and the same thing was made, uh, the same point was made at the, the Nuremberg trials about the Nazis after World War II. They looked so normal, and yet they carried out these massive atrocities. Um, so swap out torture, replace with Nazi. Now swap out spatial proximity from the previous paragraph and replace with being able to make a difference before somebody who is suffering actually dies from their suffering. Like the sailors on the ship, or the farmer at the plow in the second stanza. Or for the case of World War II, any of the Western democracies who had the resources to intervene in China or in Spain before the war, and then of course against Germany during it, but who chose not to because they were too much caught up in their own suffering to intervene to stop the suffering of others halfway around the world. Or, and I think this is a more profound point, consider that there may be a difference between the farmer at the plow, who is facing away from the direction that Icarus must have fallen from, and the sailors on, quote, the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen. That's my reading for why Auden's speaker, even though he makes it fairly passive by talking about the ship instead of the sailors, he doesn't say the sailors on the expensive, delicate ship, he says the ship must have seen, which is personification, which I'll go into next week. Um, he says they must have seen. There cannot be any doubt that the ship was positioned so that the sailors on board must have seen Icarus falling, and they did nothing. Perhaps because they believed that if it wasn't him, it would be someone else, right? And so what difference does it make? If it's, you know, if it's, I mean, he's a guy falling out of the sky, and you sure, you don't see that every day, but on the other hand, you know, is it is it a big enough problem for me to jump out of my boat and, and make the effort of trying to save his life? speaker is hinting that it made quite a difference to Icarus. And so by our awareness of someone else's suffering, which by the way, poems like this one are endeavoring to promote, right? Um, we become partly responsible for assisting those who suffer once their suffering is pointed out to us. You enter the poem thinking about art, for a poem which is obviously about art commenting on itself, a poem commenting on a painting, and which may not seem at all to be related to the politics of World War II. You exit the poem having been made aware of a profound moral imperative toward other people who are suffering wherever, whenever, and you know because of who, whoever uh, they might, whatever, whatever reason they might have been suffering. The first step is recognizing that Auden and Bruegel agree that all suffering is valid, no matter what race you belong to or what country you hail from. If you're suffering, then that's a human being suffering and you ought to do something once you're aware of it. <coughs> Also, there's an awareness that qualifying some people's suffering as being more important than other people's suffering is a trap, a tremendously, a tremendous moral trap that can lead directly to discrimination and even extermination. Because remember, Hitler based everything that Germany did during the Third Reich on what he called the unnecessary suffering that the Allies from World War I inflicted on the Germans through the peace conditions of the Treaty of Versailles. And that that suffering, to him, was more important to Germany than the suffering of the Jews, the Gypsies, the homosexuals, and eventually the Poles, the Russians, the French, the English, and the Americans, anybody that might stand against him or who were non-Aryans in general, right? That's a trap. I think a pretty profound one, and you have to be crazy to make it, I suppose. Um, but it is related to the indifference that the sailors on the ship uh, demonstrated toward Icarus when he was falling to his death. But Auden goes further than Bruegel to say that suffering, although perhaps a constant, is not so great an enemy as indifference to suffering, which makes villains of us all. I'm actually not sure that Auden and Bruegel disagree on, on that last point, but I do think it's true that I certainly wouldn't have seen it in Bruegel's painting without Auden's help. And that is, is my main point here about the uh, interaction between the poem and the painting. So just to conclude, when you are reading ekphrastic poetry, develop separate senses of the tone of both the artwork and the poem toward their shared subject matter. In this case, it was suffering, All right? And then keep comparing those stances, you know, Bruegel's stance on suffering, Auden's stance on suffering. Uh, Bruegel's stance looked pretty bad to me at the beginning, and I worked my way around to the, the idea that Auden was actually much more um, lucid about what suffering does to us um, and what ignoring someone else's suffering does to us as well. But now I think I see it a little bit in Bruegel, um, and I'm, I'm compelled to think that Auden's speaker has a really you know, interesting and intelligent way of, of um, you know, pointing out some things about the old masters and their attitudes towards suffering. 
which really haven't changed all that much over time. More of us are dying, but then again there are more of us. A lot of the work of an ekphrastic poem is to continually resituate the speaker's stance toward the artwork. Neither is going to be stable, so you can't just assume, that's what Bruegel means, let me just concentrate on the poem, or something like that. But I would argue, if you have a good understanding of what tone is and how you go about assessing it within a poem, the ekphrastic poem can be an enormously rich text that you already have all the tools that you need in order to, under, to explore it capably and to understand it completely. So I hope that's a confidence builder even though I know I went on for a long time. So um, in the email that I'm sending this out, I just uh, and I'll just remind you now, what I'd like you to do is to continue uh, developing your comments on this poem. It's a rich one. There's a lot in there. Um, I know I talked about the torturer's horse and everything, but there are other images that we can explore. Uh, and I do want to hear from you how you're responding, you know, both to the ideas that I'm putting out here in the lecture and also to both the painting and the poem in relationship to one another. So. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing your responses to all of this on Twitter. And um, apart from that, look for an email from me announcing that the illustration groups um, that you know you should be you should be able to go to Blackboard once I've um, put up the images that you'll be uh, responding to yourselves for the for the week two illustration. And also, if you are in the uh, the third round of fake poets, I'll I'll be sending you an email too with the list of poems that you can choose from. So. Thank you.